All righty then. Uh, well, uh, if you're a first-time guest, whether watching online or physically here, we want to welcome you to Transformation Church. Thank you so much for being here. And let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facility partnerships. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And to the TC family, welcome. Happy 14th anniversary. We're 14 years old this weekend. Yes. I was a young lad when we first started. It's funny how much you think you know when you're young. And as you grow older, you're like, I really don't know and still don't know. Which, by the way, that's how you learn. Uh, for those of you who have ears, let them hear. So it is so, it's so good to see everybody. We are continuing our series, uh, My Name Is. We have walked through uh, the names of God revealed in the Old Testament, which ultimately are embodied in the person of Jesus. God describes his actions by his name. And so word association allows us to remember. One of the common themes throughout the Old Testament, moving into the New Testament, is this. Remember. Remember. Why? Because life will hit you so hard, you get a spiritual concussion, and it's easy to forget. But we remember who God is by God's name. We've looked at him as the shepherd from Psalm 23. Vicky did a phenomenal job teaching Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Yeah, she crushed it, right? And now we're going to look at El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. But before we do, we got to talk about something. May 25th, 1977. Now, for those of you who are in your teen years and under 30, that's when phones were attached to the wall. Only people that used the internet was the military, and only people that used cell phones was the military. We actually, now teenagers, listen to this. We actually had to leave our house and go to a place called an arcade to play video games. It's amazing. It's astonishing. You actually got exercise walking about a mile. Never mind. But something happened on that day. Something that has captivated generations ever since. George Lucas came out with Star Wars. That's a big deal. Oh, don't tell me you don't like Darth Vader, the greatest villain of all time other than Thanos. We need a Thanos origin story. But why is it that for generations this story has captivated people? Here's why. Because within our spiritual DNA... There's this hardwiring to overcome evil with good. There's this hardwiring to be a part of a story that's bigger than ourselves. An example of that is for, you know, uh, some of you are diehard UNC football fans, Gamecock fans, Clemson fans, and like, it's like, we won the game. Like, dude, you didn't play <laughs> at all. What do you mean, we? <laughs> it's like we won. I'm like, okay, I, 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 I get it. But inside of us, there's a desire to be a part of a big story. And we see with Star Wars this incredible story of overcoming evil with good that ultimately the Jedi rise and they defeat the Sith. Why do we like that? It's because God has put it in our hearts to be a part of his big story to overcome evil with the gospel. Now, here's the hard part. We live in what's called the Enlightenment. It happened several hundred years ago, basically in Europe, and it comes down to this by a guy named Rene Descartes. By the way, uh, we talk about intelligent things here because I don't think you're dumb. And by the way, we talk to our teenagers the way they do in AP calculus and AP history. We don't dumb it down here. So you understand me? Like, we're going to use big theological words and we're going to explain them. Okay, so here we go. The Enlightenment, basically by Rene Descartes, was a philosophy that said, I think, therefore I am. And what happened is man became the center of everything. And so we even translate that to our faith, and we say things like this, my personal relationship with Jesus. That's true. I have a personal relationship with Jesus, but it's not just me, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the universe. I'm in relationship or covenant not only with Jesus, 
but with Jesus's people and a part of Jesus's mission. If you've been around here longer than five minutes, you're gonna hear, you're gonna know what I'm gonna say next. If you don't know God's story, you're gonna ask God to be in your story, and God does not play co star to anybody. A lot of our prayers go unanswered because you're not asking, Lord, your will be done. You're asking my will be done. And we just went through a series on prayer. Most of us are not praying. What we're doing is superstition and manipulation to get God to do what we want to do to minimize pain. And God is going, I know what's best in a fallen world. Trust me, the greatest prayer you can pray and I can pray is, Lord, your will be done and shut up. And have an open heart and watch him do what he wants to do in us and through us. And Star Wars is this picture of how God wants to rescue us. So watch this. El Shaddai is a beautiful Hebrew name. It means the Lord God Almighty. The origin of word is like the mountain. When you see mountains, and by the way, no disrespect, we don't have mountains in North Carolina. I know y'all think they're nice. But I went to school in Utah, and I spent a lot of time in Montana. Those are mountains, but we won't tell anybody. We'll let y'all have y'all little mountains. Okay, when you see a mountain, you're like, wow. And so the imagery is God is like, wow, and, and, and God is powerful. So, so El Shaddai, one of the names of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Scripture. And if you're new here, we're not talking about the universe. You don't have to worship something that's created. And besides, the universe is inanimate. It has no power. You can worship the one who created the intricacies and the beauty of the universe. His name is El Shaddai. El Shaddai, check this out, is on a mission to rescue humanity and creation. Understand this. Here at Transformation Church, the way we understand the gospel is not only does God want to transform us and bring us into his kingdom, but one day he's actually going to redeem the whole world. God's goal is to bring heaven to earth. One day, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and you're going to have a glorified, resurrected body. You're going to get your abs back. You're going to get your hair back. Stretch marks going to be gone. But most importantly, you're going to be back in the presence of God on your face, worshiping him. People go, when I get to heaven, I'm going to say this to God. The only thing you're going to say to God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you're not going to be looking for your grandma. You're not going to be looking for your mama. You're going to be looking for the one who is dripped in blood. And you're going to fall at your face. Salvation is not just rescuing me. Salvation is also God using Abraham's family to be a part of his mission to rescue the world. So, so where are we getting this from? The Bible. Uh, we do a lot of scripture here because frankly, I ain't got much to say unless it's tethered to the word of God. So we're going to scamper over to Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, and we're going to find out about the name El Shaddai. And it's happening in a very pivotal point. Here comes a big word in God's redemptive history. Redemption means to buy back. God is on a mission to rescue humanity and the world, ultimately through the person of Jesus. But it begins with a man by the name of Abram who became Abraham. Listen, if you and I do not know the story of Abraham, we will have a small view of the gospel. Without Abraham, there would be no Jesus, no nation of Israel. How do we know? Check it out. So up at this point in human history, Adam and Eve blew up the Garden of Eden. This virus called sin infected all of us. Uh, how do we know it did? Because we're going to die. And here's another thing too, and this is very offensive to modern ears. How do we know that we are quote unquote sinners? Case in point, why do we have to teach kids how to share? Why is the first words our kids mine and no? Who taught you that? And then when they get older, you take them through a drive-thru and clothes you bought and a house you bought that they live in and a car that you bought that they drive in and you order a hamburger, a drink, and some fries. And you say, little Joey, can I have some fries? No, they're mine. <laughs> Bruh, really? I think inherently we all know we're not what we should be. Even secular progressives are into self-help improvement. Why do I need to improve myself if something's not wrong with me? Hello. 
little cultural apologetics I just eh, threw in there. Okay, here we go. All right, so, so, so God calls Abraham, and through him, he's going to restore the world by rescuing humanity and creation through Abraham's family. Check this out. When Abram was 99 years old, brother was old, the Lord, that's Yahweh, appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. So notice, God himself comes to Abraham and says, let me tell you who I am. Uh, let me give it to you, San Antonio, Texas, 1985. Do you know who my dad is? You need to remind yourself of who your father is. He is El Shaddai. Him and the devil are not in an arm wrestling match going, ooh, ooh. no, 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 no. He is the sovereign king above all, in all, through all, who's revealed himself in King Jesus. That's who your dad is. By the way, it's, it, it's, it's hard to trust someone you don't know. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. In the Hebrew context, that just means faithful. It doesn't mean perfect. I will make a covenant. That's an agreement, a relationship with you, by which I will, notice, I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. So keep in mind, Abraham's 99. That's not exactly the most fertile time of your age. So even at 52, and by the way, when I was in my 20s, I didn't think this was true, but a guy, I was 28, he was 36, 39, he goes, yeah, man, when you hit my age, you just have more down days. I'm like, yeah, whatever, dude. I'm like, he was right. <laughs> at this, watch what happens. Abraham fell down on the ground. That's worship. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. You know what this word is? It's gonim. It means ethnic groups, okay? So if someone tells you, why do you talk about race from the Bible? Say, you can't have a Bible if you don't talk about race because the Bible is about the human race comprised of different ethnicities that God wants to rescue. It is asinine, it is ignorant, and it's demonic to say, why are you talking about race? Was Jesus not a Jew? Were there not Egyptians and Canaanites and Hittites and Presbyterians and probably Anstedbites? I, I'm just tired of like, why are you talking about race? Dude, Jesus is Jewish. He wasn't a Martian. The Bible's about rescuing the human race. Enough of that. Verse 5. I'm feisty this morning. Verse 5. <laughs> What's more? I'm changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many ethnic groups, and I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many ethnic groups or nations, and kings will be among them, primarily King Jesus. So ultimately, this is talking about the church, which is comprised of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. So understand this, Transformation Church, you are a part of this story. God, you are in this. You are in this. Question, if God saw you, why do you feel so unseen? And social media has made it so bad. Like whenever you feel bad about, about yourself, you just throw something on Instagram and, oh, you're enough, you're the best, you get a little dopamine hit, and then you do it again, and then you have to ante it up and ante it up, and then what happens is your show, so media actually becomes a diary of a dopamine hit because you are not looking at God to go, I saw you before your mama saw your daddy at the frat party and said, I want him. <laughs> Listen, I'm grateful for each of you, I really am. But God saw me before I was ever born. I don't have to be seen by other people to feel okay because the eternal God who's called El Roy, the God who sees, has always saw me. So question, who do we believe more? Check this out, guys. We're a part of a big story. So this big old building ain't always been here. Uh, we met about a half mile down the road, and we met in this little warehouse, and they wanted me to keep AstroTurf in there because they're like, dude, you're a football player. Let's keep AstroTurf. I'm like, no, we're not keeping AstroTurf. <laughs> and so it was a handful of people. And, and so understand, there's a lot of prayer, a lot of sacrificial giving, a lot of sacrifice that went into this. And, and, and then here's our first service, February 7, 2010. I don't know if you see this right here, but notice we couldn't finish painting the walls. We are a blue-collar church. 
I still have this attitude out of the mud, even though we got a big Battlestar Galactica auditorium. This is my roots here, that all we had was a lot of Jesus, and all we need is a lot of Jesus. We were literally in the worst location with the worst signage in the history of humanity, and four of our first five years were one of the fastest growing churches in these United States of America. On our first Sunday, 701 people showed up. It's been crazy. Uh, let me show you guys this, just to show you how you're a part of this, this bigger Pastor story. Pastor here at the new Transformation Church 521 location. The building is coming up. Uh, going to spend tonight with staff and our servant leaders praying over our property and just thanking God for his faithfulness. It's awesome. Who's that little kid? <laughs> he didn't have a clue. Oh, man, but he had a lot of Jesus, though. So the building you're in just didn't fall out of space. People gave their time. They gave their financial treasure. They gave their allegiance to Jesus. And so as we multiply more campuses over the next 10 years, we're going to have four more campuses. We're already starting with TC Lake Wiley. We got more announcements coming. We have one passion to reach people for King Jesus so they can live an upward, inward, outward life. We want multi-ethnic, multi-generational, gospel-shaped churches to influence not only this area, not only this nation, but ultimately the world. This isn't about us. This is about King Jesus. So don't just see it as what can I get out of it. See it as how can I be a part of what God is doing. So watch this, family. El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, and King Jesus births Abraham's family through the gospel. So, so this is the family that we are, not just here, but around the world. But, but let's look at how this happens. This is Galatians 3, 8, and 9. Now, the Scripture saw in advance. Teenagers, look at this. Grab a hold of this. Now, the Scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The word justify means that he looks at Gentiles and Jews who trust Jesus as though they followed the Ten Commandments perfectly. That's called righteousness or justification. The only way you and I can be in relationship with God is if we're as righteous as God, and none of us are as righteous as God, so God himself comes to be our righteousness. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him who knew no sin become sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And how does it happen? By faith. And what did he do? God proclaimed the gospel ahead of time to Abraham. Let's pause here. When God talked to Abraham, he didn't say nothing about the cross or resurrection. The gospel is God promised Abraham a multi-ethnic family that would be forgiven and blood-bought and declared righteous. How does that happen? Through King Jesus. All the nations, all the ethnic groups will be blessed through you. Consequently, those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Watch this. Watch the beauty of this. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He doesn't say in two seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed, who is Christ. So God made a promise to Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, nation of Israel, and then ultimately through the nation of Israel, the Jewish Messiah comes to redeem and rescue the world. Now, please understand this, y'all. Redemption is more than forgiveness. And I would say that many of us, and hear my heart, I would say that many of us don't even think about his forgiveness very much. I would say that many of us don't think about the fact that he reconciled and made us friends with God very much. I, I want to challenge you that many of us, frankly, don't think about Jesus a lot. We think more about our bills that need to get paid. We, we, we worry and stress about other things. And then we go, okay, Jesus, then I'll come to you. And he's going, wait, you're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. What does it profit a man or woman if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? We need more followers of Jesus who are in to Jesus, who are in to him, who worship him who adore him. Let me say it to you this way, for you and I both, 
Do we find Jesus merely useful to get us out of trouble, or do we find him beautiful and we just want to be with him? We just want to sit with him. We just want to hear his voice. We want to look into his eyes of mercy and grace. Have you been melted by his presence and his goodness? That's what's going to change the world, not you obsessing about, oh my goodness, I don't want my kids to smoke weed. How about this? Oh my goodness, I want my kids to be so high on the love of Jesus. Nothing could wrestle them out of his hands. You see the difference? I don't know if y'all see it. I don't know if you see it because you control freaks are like, I know you're right, but I don't like it. <laughs> Guys, you can go to a Jewish synagogue you can go to a house of prayer with Muslims, and they can go, don't do drugs. That's not Christian. That's just common sense. But only the gospel can say, no one can love and forgive and empower you like Jesus. I love Jesus. Now, let's look at how God fulfills his promise. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. You and I are amongst this. This is a future look. So if you don't like worship, you're going to struggle in the new heavens and new earth. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. So notice there, notice it doesn't say, and we sing a new song to you because you paid all my bills, because all my dreams came true, because I got everything I prayed for. This is the Bible. I'm pointing this to the Bible. You were slaughtered and, and you purchased that's redemption. People for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on the earth. El Shaddai, in the person of King Jesus, rescued humanity and creation by hanging on the cross. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. But Christ, by the way, Jesus' last name is not Christ. Christ is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Hamashiach or Messiah. It means the anointed one, the long foreseen promised one who would redeem and rescue the world. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. What does that mean? It means that Torah, primarily the Ten Commandments, show us all the ways we don't measure up. So case in point, you know, you look in the mirror and you're like, woo wee. I mean, there's sometimes I'll be walking by in the mirror and I'll be like, Vicky, Vic, who's this dude in the house? Oh, that's me. Man, I, I remember when I was like 199 pounds, man, I was so cut, I needed Band-Aids. I mean, man, I had an eight pack. Now I just got a barrel. <laughs> I mean, man, I'm like, what happened? Who is this? That's kind of what the law does is it shows you how holy God is and how unholy we are. Now, here's one of the beautiful mysteries. One of the ways that you know you're growing in your faith, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, just marinate. This is for the followers of Christ. One of the ways you know you're growing in your faith, paradoxically and simultaneously, you're going, oh my goodness, I cannot believe God would love a person like me. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe that God sees a person like me the way he sees Jesus. Simultaneously, and it turns into this beautiful worship of going, I never knew I was this jacked up toe up from the flow up, and I never knew I was so beautiful and faultless in his eyes. This is what Jesus did for you. If you're not a follower of Christ yet, this is what Jesus did for you. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Think about it. Think about this. How radical is this? God the Father's like, I want the children. I, I made a promise with Abraham to get a multi-ethnic family. 
And this family is unrighteous, so I'm going to send my son Jesus to be their righteousness. This, this family is unholy, so I'm going to send my son Jesus to be their holiness. This, this, these people are sinful, but I'm going to send my son Jesus to be sinless for them. That he literally takes your place. So here's a couple things. God is patient and merciful and good. And secondly, why do you consider yourself trash and junk if God paid such a high price for you? You think it's the neighborhood you come from that determines your value. Whether you live in Ballantyne or in a trailer park, without Jesus, you're still going to hell. Yeah, hell's still in the Bible. God goes, no, no, each and every one of you, I'm going to the cross for you. Friends, no one's going to love you and I the way Jesus loves you and I. He literally took our place for every wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Jesus literally took our curse so that we could receive his blessing. And at Transformation Church, we are on a mission to let the world know. Years ago, there's a family here, the Venroots. Um, the Venroots at that time were in their early 70s. They may be, gosh, man, they may be in their 80s now. And they went into Kershaw Prison and uh, they found a book of mine, gave it to the inmates. And before you knew it, we had a ministry in Kershaw to prison inmates. We, we, we've seen incredible things. With COVID, that kind of shut down a little bit. And so we prayed, God, would you, would you help us to continue this ministry of reaching people behind bars to let them know that the Lord has not forgotten them? And the Lord loves to answer those kind of prayers. You know, the scripture says that he'll give you above and beyond what you think, hope, or imagine, that you'll be like, ooh, gee willikers. <laughs> it is my honor and privilege to announce to you, Transformation Church. Let me go through that, past that scripture right there. It's Transformation Church is partnering with an organization called Edovo that they're going to provide 300,000 tablets with our sermons loaded on them for 400 prisons in 40 states. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Y'all, do, you know, do you know how many 300,000 is? Like our congregation just grew like 18 billion percent. <laughs> like we weren't even looking for it. It was a person that used to be a part of our church, moved out to Cali, going back to Cali. Going back to Cali, hmm, I don't think so. I'm sorry, I'm a child of the 90s. Okay, and he was like, I know a church that really cares about these men and w women with incredible gospel content. So Transformation Church, we're trying to reach everybody. And you tell you what, if Martians come, we are gonna save them too. El Shaddai and King Jesus gives you and I a new uniform with a new mission. A new uniform with a new mission. Hey, question, what would you do if you seen this guy directing traffic? <laughs> what would you do if you seen an astronaut directing traffic? Well, you'd probably take a picture, you'd probably put it on a gram, and then you'd probably be like, that is not in the right place, bro. You're supposed to be in a spaceship in outer space, not directing traffic. Your uniform, <laughs> he likes that. Your, your uniform determines your identity and your function. Do you know what uniform you're wearing, follower of Christ? I know you think it's your little low Gucci. Look at that, my Gucci. It's about that time. I think you know it's your little Louis Vuitton or whatever it may be. Oh, we have a uniform that's so much better. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ, that's the Holy Spirit calling, and all who have been united with Christ, watch this now, united with Christ in baptism. This is the act of spiritual baptism. When you recognize you need Jesus as your Savior, you're baptized into Christ. And so the spiritual takes place, and then you move into the physical baptism in the water to symbolize it. 
All who were, who've been united with Christ in baptism, that watch this, have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Oh, man. Guys, this is the one thing that has transformed me immensely is knowing the uniform I'm wearing. And I don't know, in God's sovereignty and his providence, in high school, I wore a uniform. It's called Converse Judson. We were red and silver. In college at Brigham Young, I wore a uniform. It was blue and white. When I got to the Colts, it was blue and white. When I got to the Panthers, it was blue, black, and teal. That uniform determined what I do. Now, I'm like, it makes sense. When I played for the Panthers, I didn't play for the Redskins. I didn't play for the Giants. I didn't play for them Cowboys. How about them Cowboys? Let me move on. <laughs> You guys are some hope-filled people. (laughs) Next year is going to be our year, buddy. (laughs) Question, what uniform do you see yourself wearing? You know what uniform we see ourselves wearing? I was sexually abused. I was rejected. My mom and dad didn't give me the attention I, I needed. I'm from a poor neighborhood, dot, dot, dot. And notice, you see more of you than of Christ. And the more you see of you than of Christ, the more you're going to stay stuck. When you wake up in the morning, realize, if God sees Christ in you, why are you calling him a liar? No, you and I are. When, when I get tired... I default back to my flesh. And if I make a mistake, Derwin, you're so disorganized. Gosh, man, you're dumb. Look at you. And all these voices from the past begin to beat beat me up, and I got to go, wait, 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 hold on, wait, wait, wait. You know, that may be true, but it still don't determine my uniform. And when I begin to think about my uniform, I begin to act as such. Some of you are going, oh, man, I, I got to stop pouring. I got to stop saying I got to stop pouring and start saying, these are the hands of Christ. I'm clothed in him. I am not going to use the mind of Christ, the eyes of Christ, the heart of Christ to look at this trash. If you do that, watch what happens. The sting and attraction will go away. Whenever you say what you're not going to do, guess what you're going to do? Do it. You know how you do when you see a sign that says, don't step on the grass? You're like, (laughs) wet paint, don't touch. (laughs) What I would do is I would put a sign that says, after you touch the wet paint, wash your hands. Guys, what attracts sin is do's and don'ts. When you focus on worship, you become like that which you worship. Putting on Christ. And so as a result of putting on Christ, look what happens. There is no longer Jew or Gentile. So what's happening? Paul's writing to a multi-ethnic church in Galatia, modern day Turkey. So understand, there's people from all over the world. Now here's important. This is, this is where I have to really help, help us. In Paul's day, the aspect of someone's color had nothing to do with ethnicity. You could be a dark African, but if you thought after Alexander the Great, you would be called a Hellenists. Some of the Roman emperors were actually black, but your skin didn't determine your order of rank. That didn't happen until the European enlightenment with white people here and everybody else below them. In this day and age, it was your ethnicity and tribe. And so the Jews were going, hey, you Gentiles, we're the Jews, we're the original people, we're the varsity, you're JV. And the Gentiles were like, no, 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 no. Paul said, we're all justified. And they would argue. And Paul's going, stop seeing yourself as Jews and Gentiles. I think today he would say, stop seeing yourself as Republicans and Democrats. Now, I'm not saying don't vote. I am saying vote because that's your American right. But don't be a jerk about it. Don't think you got saved because your person won. He said, no, no, your ethnicity is not obliterated. It's celebrated. Guys, prejudice and racism in the body of Christ is an affront to Jesus. I'm going to challenge you. Some of you will be with your family members and you'll let them say the N-word. You'll let them talk about white people all kind of way and you won't say nothing. Today, that ends. That ends today. 
Stop being a coward. Because you're not keeping peace. You're participating in dysfunction. And then it goes on, slave or free. Really quickly here, 85 to 50% of the Roman Empire were indentured servants or doulos. It could have been, hey, I owe you some money, so I'm going to come work for you and pay it off. It could have been by captured by war. Was it good? Of course not. But was it American slavery based on the color of skin? No, it was not. And a person in this culture could actually buy their freedom. The word is doulos, right? So the point here that Paul is making is this. Classism. Don't treat the person who lives in the projects or trailer park less than the person who's a VP at Bank of America. Which, by the way, and I'm going I'm to hit this real quick and get off. Some of you guys need to go in law because white-collar crime costs America $300 billion a year and nobody go to jail. All they do is pay a fine after they made millions of dollars. Every year, some bank in Charlotte's like, by the way, yes, we made 10,000 fake accounts and made a bunch of money. No one's going to jail, and here's a $10 million fine. Now, we made $100 million, but here's 10. But if your name is Pookie or Jose, you go going to jail for $20 worth of weed. Yeah, some of us need to, like some of you young ones, go into law and, and bring about justice. Male and female, men and women are co-heirs and co-equal in Christ. When we put on this uniform, and I'm going to talk primarily to the men, okay? This isn't for all men. I don't think we have this issue at our church, but it's very important. Male and female, we are equal in Christ. For me to be the leader of my home means Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? Hey, you Christians, you better do what I said do. I'm the boss. No. It says he went to a cross and he sacrificed his life. So to, do, to be a leader means you're in a posture of serving, not dictating, not domineering. Some of you, and I'm saying this with, with love, some of you are scared little boys who didn't get the affirmation and attention, and you hide behind Bible passages like, I'm the boss, woman, do what I say. Guys, that is the exact opposite of Jesus who said, look how much I love you. I'm bleeding for you. Now, on the flip side, Ephesians 5.33 says this, wives, see to it that you respect your husband. The man knows you love him. That's kind of in your nature. But respect, that doesn't mean to be a doormat. Respect means, listen, if nobody ain't for you, baby, I'm with you. If you want to move to an island like Gilligan, I'll go with you. I'm with you. I'm behind you. I believe in you. And here's the, and here's the thing. For some women, because of a lack of men, you've had to play this fighter role. And every time a good man comes, you punch him in the nose because you're afraid. The gospel moves us to a place of love and respect. For those of you that are single, married, whatever, it's a posture of love and respect. Men, we are servants, not dictators, not domineering. We are servants. We, we pour out our blood. This new society with this new uniform, racism and prejudice is crucified. Classism is crucified. Misogyny is crucified. And feminism is crucified. We become this beautiful family. Why? For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And now, I love how Paul goes. He goes, and now, and now that you belong to Christ. Oh, man. This gets me every time, y'all. I love how he writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. He puts all this down, your children of God, new uniform, one with Christ. There's no racism, prejudice. There's no classism. There's no sexism. And you belong to Christ. Oh, my goodness. There's a lot of organizations we can belong to. I love my grandmother, but I belong to Jesus. I love Transformation Church, but I belong to Jesus. Who greater can we belong to than King Jesus?
And the true children of Abraham are those who have faith in Christ. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. We're trying to create more communities like this all over this city, all over this state, all over this country, and eventually all over the world. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus called out to them. This is his original 12 Jewish disciples. Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Let me ask you this, and I ask us this question all the time. How many people would come to Jesus by faith if God answered all your prayers? That probably hits you right here in the dome piece. You're like, uh... I want to challenge you. For the next week, pray about people you know that don't know Jesus to come to faith to him. Through your influence of you sharing the gospel with them, inviting them to Transformation Church partnership, and watch how other things in your life begin to fall into place. Write this down. Matthew 6, 8, which Vicki did a great job preaching on last week, and Matthew 6, 32. Both of those verses, Jesus says, the Father already knows what you need. Why do you spend so much time on your needs and not his kingdom? When his kingdom comes first, the order gets into place. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Transformation Church, on our 14th birthday, we're going to do what we've always done. We have left our nets, and we're going to follow him. That's why we're going to T.C. Lake Wiley. I want you to take a look at this video of baptisms throughout the last 14 years. Over 2,000 people have been baptized in the last 14 years. I'm praying that the next 2,000 will come a lot faster because we want to see people come to know King Jesus. Our next baptism is on March 17th. If you follow Christ, you've never been baptized, sign up to be baptized. If you were baptized when you were little and it wasn't your decision, it didn't, didn't mean much to you, be baptized as a believer. It is symbolic of the new uniform you have in Christ. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, the name that is so sweet, the one who reveals the great El Shaddai, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are faithful to give Abraham his family, which we are a part of, and that you are faithful to rescue the world through us. What a privilege, what an honor. Thank you for the grace. And right now, I want to pray for those who are saying, hey, pastor, um, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to stop playing games. I know about Jesus. I've attended church, but I'm ready to give my life to him. Listen, today is your day of surrender. Today is your day that you actually, by faith, in the deepest part of your soul, say yes to Jesus as the one who hung on the cross for your wrongdoing. He died your death, and he rose again to give you his life. If that's you, say this to him. Enter into covenant with him by faith. Say this to him in the silence of your heart. Today, King Jesus, I believe that on that cross, it should have been me, but it was you. All of my wrongdoing came to you and all of your right doing came to me. All of my sin was transferred to your body and all of your holiness was transferred to me. I believe that by faith, I am forgiven and I believe that on the third day, you rose again to invite me into your kingdom and I choose to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Family, here is our soul tattoo. Our soul tattoo is what's the statement that summarizes this message? 
Treasure El Shaddai and his gospel. Treasure El Shaddai and his gospel. What's our action step? Find your place at TC by visiting our website, transformationchurch.tc backslash find your place. Listen, each of you online and in person at our new TC Lake Wiley campus and future campuses, you have a role. And I know you're going, but pastor, I'm not qualified. Don't worry about that. Jesus has used messed up people his whole time because that's all he got to work with. And he wants to use us all powerfully and beautifully. Would you stand? We're going to sing to our Father and let him know how great he is. Paul here, and I want to thank you for joining us online today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or you have questions about the service, we want to encourage you to scan the QR code on the device or screen in front of you, and we'll make sure to connect with you regarding your decision or question. Also, if you're ever in the Indian land, South Carolina or Charlotte area, we want to invite you to come join us in the house on Sundays. Finally, we want to close this service like we do all of our services, and that's with our benediction. Our benediction is a good word, and our good word is our vision. And together we say upward, inward, outward, transformers roll out. The reason we do that is upward, we love God completely. Inward, we love ourselves correctly. And outward, we love others compassionately. And I've invited some friends to join me today to come close our service. And the reason we do that is because this is just the... Oh. And now it's time to go play the... Yay. All right, on the count of three, stand wherever you are today and join us in our benediction. One, two, three. Upward, inward, outward, transformers, roll out. Have a great day.